It's so good to, to see you this morning. God has certainly blessed us with, with a beautiful Lord's Day. We, as the people of God, as friends and neighbors, we assemble together to draw, draw strength from one another and certainly from the Word of God. As we pour out our hearts to God in praise and adoration for the way that He has so bountifully blessed us. I'm really glad you're, you're here this morning. And we're also very thankful for our guests this morning. You know, throughout this pandemic, we have been blessed, just blessed in abundance with, with guests. And we just want you to know just how much we appreciate you. Just let you know that you're always welcome at Kim Walton. As a result of the circumstances, sometimes it, it makes hospitality and greeting you and getting to know you a little better, a, a little difficult. And we look forward to a time when we can do that. And we can help you in the meantime. I would encourage you to go to our website, www.kimbrewchurchofchrist.com. You'll find our contact information there. We would encourage you to contact us. Um, certainly, we can talk and get to know each other that way. Whatever you need, we want to be there um, to help you. You know, this morning for just a few minutes, I, you know, I recognize that, that our conditions right now are, are, are somewhat difficult, especially for you moms and dads out there as, as you're wrestling uh, young kids and let me just say this, is if I haven't been as cognizant of that in recent weeks by way of the time, I, I, I apologize. But I want you to know how much I appreciate you. You know, but just for a few minutes this morning, I want to talk to you about what I would just deem just a much needed subject. One that is lacking, I think, sorely in our culture and certainly has the potential to even infiltrate uh, to the people of God. I want to talk to you about the subject this morning, kindness. Uh, brother, you would agree that, that we live in a world, we, we live in a culture where, well, kindness at times, it just, it, it's somewhat rare. <laughs> so rare, I, I think even to the extent, I, I think sometimes when it happens, when kindness is demonstrated, we're almost shocked. <laughs> to the extent at times that it, that it causes us to question the motives of the person that's extending the, the kindness. What's this about? You know, too often our world is characterized by, by harshness, sharpness, selfishness. And brethren, you would agree that that's a shame. And we, as the people of God, we, we are to be different. We're to be holy. Uh, it's our job to show the world a better way. You know, kindness, when you think about it, is one of those words that you know it when you see it, but it's a little bit difficult to, at times to define because it combines a, a number of, of attributes. You know, kindness is, is certainly selfless. Kindness is merciful. Kindness is the idea of being disposed to do good to others. It's to be tender as opposed to being sharp and harsh. It's goodwill. It's the temporary disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others. It's, it's to be exercised cheerfully in, in gratifying their wishes if possible, supplying at their wants, or even alleviating their distress. As one author put it, kindness ever accompanies love. The proverbial writer in Proverbs 27, it stands in nine, he would say, oil and perfume make the heart glad. And the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Kindness is sweet. The wise man says the sweetness of a friend. Your, your version may say the, the tenderness of a friend. In Romans, the 12th chapter at verse 10, a chapter that's that's predicated upon the mercies of God. Paul will say in Romans 12 and at verse 10 to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. The idea there is written in the original language is the idea of outdoing one another and showing value or showing honor to one another. And I would just say, brother, even in the kingdom of God, we need more of that. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, another chapter that lays out the results of, of the proper response to, to what the Lord has done for us, a description of the new man in Christ. In Ephesians 4 and verse 32, the writer says, be kind 
Be kind to one another. Tender heart. Forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Be kind to one another, Paul says. Be tender hearted. Be, be willing to forgive one another. And we could go on and on. And we could spend uh, days, uh, I think, looking at the kindness of our Lord and as he walked this earth. And brethren, let's just say this the Lord's body, the kingdom of God, the church, it should be an escape from the world, it should be a refuge from the harsh. And selfish attitudes of the world. The world should see and experience kindness from the people of God. Brethren should experience kindness, tender hearts from their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And sir, we extend kindness as recipients of the Lord's loving kindness. Amen. You know, this morning, as we consider the idea of kindness, I want us to look at an incident in the life of King David. One that really gets a little attention by way of some of the other events involving the king, but one that I believe, no doubt, is there for a reason. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you have your Bible this morning, I hope that you do. I want to read 2 Samuel chapter 9. I want to read... It's a short chapter. I want to read the entire chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Let's begin reading at verse 1. The Bible says, Then David said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Verse 2 says, And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. The king said, Is there not anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there's still a son of Jonathan who's crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in, in Lodebar. Then King David sent out and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodebar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you. For the sake of your father, Jonathan, who stored to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again, he prostrated himself, verse 8, and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Verse 9 says, And the king called Saul's servants, even said to him, All that belong to Saul, to all the house, I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, according to all the Lord my, that the Lord the king commands his servants, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Verse 12 says, Mephibosheth had a younger son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. And it says, now he was lame in both feet. That's beautiful, right? Just a, a beautiful display of really what we might mean outrageous kindness. David doing something that he didn't have to do, wanted to do. I want you to consider the context in which this all takes place. You remember that Saul was the first king of Israel. He was a man of great promise and potential. He was God's choice. But he was long story short, he was disobedience. So God removed the kingship, the monarchy from Saul and his family, and he chose David, an unlikely choice at the time, to be the second king of Israel. And as a result of this, for the rest of Saul's life, he was an unsettled and paranoid man. And he sought to kill David, leaving David to run for his life for a number of years before Saul would ultimately die. And then following that for a number of years, there were civil wars. David backed by Judah and certainly with God's approval. And then on the other side, there were those who still backed Saul's son, Ishabath. And, and this civil war would last some seven years before David would eventually prevail and solidify his throne as king over all of Israel. Now what? Let's make a couple of observations from the text in regards to David's kindness. Number one, brethren, I want us to appreciate that David took the initiative 
to show kindness. I want you to go back in the text. I want you to look at verse 1 again. The Bible says, then David said, is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David says, show kindness for the sake of Jonathan. Now, you remember that Jonathan was Saul's son. He was the prince of Israel. We mentioned those years that David was on the run as, as Saul would seek to kill David and, and really an attempt to, to thwart the will of God. And, and you would think that Jonathan, the son of the king, the heir apparent, if Saul was successful, you're thinking through a carnal lens, you would think that Jonathan would be all about that, but he wasn't. Jonathan would turn out to be a wonderful friend to David, even aiding David by way of sparing his life, protecting David uh, from his father. And as a result, David and Jonathan would make a covenant. And no doubt, even through years, even though years and years would pass, Jonathan now dead, David at this moment, I believe, he recalls the covenant that he had made with Jonathan all of those years before. If you still got your Bibles open, I want you to turn back to, to the first chapter with me, to 1 Samuel chapter 20, I should say. 1 Samuel chapter 20. I want you to look with me at verse 14. This is Jonathan speaking to David years and years before our text this morning. Jonathan says this to David. If I'm still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? You shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. Not even when the Lord cuts off one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. Jonathan made David bow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. In other words, Jonathan says, David, show me the loving kindness of the Lord when you become king. Show me mercy, David. Show my house mercy. And you remember Jonathan, he was a God-fearing man. And he knew that David would be the next king of Israel. And when a king in those days would take over and a new dynasty, a new monarchy was established in an attempt to avoid the potential of civil war, the king, he would come in and he would eliminate. He would kill anything and anyone associated with the previous king and certainly any potential heir to the throne. No one would have even blinked an eye if David had proceeded as other kings did. And certainly when you think about all that Saul had put David through. But David, no doubt, remembering this covenant made with his friend Jonathan all those years before. He takes the initiative to show kindness. And I'll tell you something else about this text. As I read it, it just jumps off the page to me. When you consider the covenant that was made, when you consider the scope of, of this covenant, the kindness that David shows Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson, you would agree that David goes above and beyond, we might say. When it comes to the kindness that David expresses, David, he didn't just take the initiative. He lavished kindness. On Jonathan's house, what was left of it. You know, when you think about the covenant that was required of David, and certainly at this point, there's no one around to, to bind this covenant. But all that was required of David, all that he agreed to simply was he wouldn't kill Jonathan. This would have been custom for the new king when he assumed throne. At this point, we know Jonathan's already dead. And the other part of the promise that he wouldn't kill those remaining in Jonathan's house. And David certainly hadn't done that either. So as far as the covenant goes, David has fulfilled his part of the agreement. But David's not satisfied with that. He wanted to do more. If you go back to verse 1, David asked the question, is there anyone left at the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for the Lord's sake? Just for a moment, just appreciate the scope of this. David's not just asking about Jonathan's household. He wants to know about Saul's entire family. Is there anyone left? of Saul's family that I can show kindness to. Now, that's pretty amazing. Again, for those of you who have studied this, you know all that Saul had put David through. And look how far David goes with this. As he lavishes kindness on the one remaining person, the lone heir of Jonathan, not only does David spare his life, 
Uh, look at verse 7 again. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Back in our text. I want you to look at verse 7 again. David said to him, as the Phibosheth comes to the king, he says, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. David says for Mephibosheth. He's way out in Lodabar, probably as far away from the king as he could get. And he's brought before the king. You know what he's thinking at this point. Mephibosheth knew how this went. But watch what David does. He puts his mind at ease. And he tells him, don't fear. For I'm going to show you the kindness for the sake of your father. Now, watch, watch what David does here specifically. David says, I'm going to restore all the land of your grandfather Saul. Now, now, it's important that we understand when David became king, the land that Saul owned, that became David's. David doesn't have to do this, but he does. David gave to Mephibosheth all the land that had previously belonged to Saul. He restored it to him. Hang on to that word. And not only that, he tells him in the latter part of verse 7, if that's not enough, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, you shall eat at my table regularly. You're going to eat at the king's table. And in the latter part of verse 11, the text tells us that Mephibosheth ate at David's table, listen to this, as one of the king's sons. In essence, David, the king, he adopts Mephibosheth. He makes him essentially part of his family. David took the initiative in showing kindness. He lavished kindness on Mephibosheth. And, and let's make this third and final observation from the text. When we consider who Mephibosheth was, certainly he was the son of Jonathan. But at this point, that means nothing. And not only that, Mephibosheth was helpless. He didn't have anything of value to offer David. From a physical standpoint, Mephibosheth was nothing. He's living out in Lodibar, a, a, a nothing town, away from the action of Jerusalem. He's out on the east of the Jordan, this small little town. He's secluded. The text tells us that he's staying with a man, and that implies that he's nothing more than a house guest of someone. And then at the end of the chapter, we're told that Mephibosheth, he was lame in both feet. He's disabled. More than likely, he can't even take care of himself. You know, if you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 4, it describes the scene. When Saul and Jonathan died, Mephibosheth, he's just five years old at the time. And when word reaches his caretaker that the king and the, and the prince are dead, they run. And while they're running, this five-year-old Mephibosheth, he falls to the point he becomes lame. So this man has been lame for since he was five years old. And we read a moment ago how David had restored all of Saul's land to Mephibosheth. But David doesn't stop there. He recognizes that Mephibosheth, certainly, he can't tend to that land. He can't monetize that land. And at this point in his life, he's helpless. He doesn't have any servants to do it for him. He's helpless. Now, I want you to go back in the text. I want you to look at verse 9. The king called Saul's servants even and said to him, all that belong to Saul, to all of his house, I've given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. You shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And according to all that the Lord commanded his servant, so your servants will do. So Mephibosheth says, ate at the table of the one. The table is one of the king's sons. David gives him servants, workers to work the land that he'd given them. And then David didn't have to do any of this, but he did. Very simply, he was kind to Mephibosheth, just as God had been kind to him. Now, I want you to think with me for just a moment. Now that you understand the situation, the context of what takes place here, can you imagine what it must have been like to be this man in Fibosheth? From a nobody, 
helpless, more than likely dependent upon others for just the basic necessities and provisions of life. You know, how often had Mephibosheth probably thought to himself what it would have been like to be royalty? Had not his grandfather disobeyed God and the dynasty remained in his family, all the lands that would have been his. He would have then had a place at the king's table. He would have been a prince. David now. In essence, he has restored all of that. You know, we get some insight in verse 7 to what Mephibosheth must have been thinking. As David says to him, don't fear for I'm going to show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'm going to restore all the land. You're going to eat at my table regularly. Verse 8 says of Mephibosheth, says again, he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Mephibosheth recognized who he was. And I'll say it again. Can you imagine? what it must have been like to be Mephibosheth. A hopeless and helpless man, essentially nothing. But he was a recipient of the king's loving kindness. All blessings restored. A seat at the king's table. Now essentially a member of the royal family. I ask you again, can you imagine what it must have been like to be him. Well, brethren, the short answer for all of us this morning is yes. We can't imagine. You know, the question becomes for me, why is this text included for us? Certainly we have an incredible example in David of a man who was faithful and then, and then some to the covenant that he made with Jonathan. And certainly in David here, we have an incredible example of kindness and grace and mercy extended to a helpless man who had nothing to offer him. But I think this chapter and its implications, brethren, are even bigger for us this morning. And as we close, I want to call your attention to a phrase that's mentioned in our text, when David made his intention known to lavish this loving kindness on what was left of Jonathan's household, I want you to look at verse 3 in our text again this morning. The king said, is there not yet anyone in the house of Saul to whom I may show, listen to this, the kindness of God. The kindness of God. If you remember back to the covenant that was made between Jonathan and David, it was Jonathan that said, if I'm still alive, Jonathan says, when you become king, Jonathan says, show me the loving kindness of God. Is, it, is any of this starting to sound somewhat familiar to you? The heart that David showed in this text. It's a heart. It's a picture of God's heart toward us, ladies and gentlemen. We are Mephibosheth, spiritually speaking. You know, a passage that we've referred to a number of times this year. The men have referred to it by way of our assembling around the Lord's table. It's a passage that reminds us of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, reminding us of who we are apart from the loving kindness of God. In Romans chapter 5 at verse 6, brethren, we can't read this enough. The Bible says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for the righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled. Listen to this. We shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. Helpless enemies in need of restoration, in need of reconciliation. And God saw us in this helpless state with nothing to offer him. And he, as David did, he took the initiative. The Bible tells us before the foundations of the world, God put a plan in place to save the helpless, 
to give the hopeless sinner hope, to be reconciled, forgiven of our sins through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, Peter says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Brethren, we didn't deserve that. Christ died for us. And we are saved by his life. Back in Romans 5 and verse 10, Paul says we are reconciled to God through his death. But that's not all. He said we shall be saved by his life. You know, through his death. His death being the instrument of our reconciliation back to the Father. Verse 9, we are justified through his blood. All of this, the idea are forgiven the sinners. We can now stand acceptable to God. But not just that. The text says we're saved by his life. This is a reference to our Lord's life post-resurrection. Not only did he die on the cross and was buried, on the third day, he arose. You know, Jesus affirmed in John 10 and verse 18 that he had both power to, to lay down his life. But not only to lay it down, but to take it up again. And in Hebrews 7 and verse 23, and starting, it reminds us that, that he lives to make intercession for us. Having reconciled us through his death, he leaves not to, lives not to abandon us, but to make intercession for us. And what this means, brethren, in the ultimate sense, his life, it guarantees that he will ultimately deliver us from God's wrath, what we deserve, to eternal life with him and the kingdom. In heaven for all eternity. And I say all of that to say this. Just as Mephibosheth. Was a recipient of the kindness of King David. We are recipients of the loving kindness of God. And that should matter to you. And it should matter to me. Titus 3 at verse 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness, listen to this, verse four says, when the kindness of God, our savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the whole of eternal life. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, Paul said he saved us. So the answer is simple. Yes. We can certainly relate to Mephibosheth. We too, recipients of the king's loving kindness. You know, as we close this morning, I want you to put yourself again in the shoes of Mephibosheth. You're helpless. You're hopeless. You're living a life in exile. And it shows no signs of getting better. But the king, he calls for you. And you go. And you sit before him. And he offers you restoration. He offers to restore all the lands of your grandfather. Not only that, he's going to provide you with servants to tend to the land for your benefit. And not only that, he's going to offer you a seat at his table. As one of his sons. Let me ask you. If you're Mephibosheth. How senseless. Would it be. To refuse the king's. Loving kindness. You can see where I'm going with this. You see the king. This very morning. He's. Through his blood. Offering you restoration. He's offering you forgiveness of your sins. 
Sin has separated you from God, and to die in that state is to be separated from him and all that is good for all eternity, apart from the Lord. You're spiritually helpless. You're hopeless. But he offers you reconciliation. He offers you to be his heir, an adopted son, with all spiritual blessings found in Christ. And ultimately what that means, a home in heaven when this life is over. How senseless would it have been for Mephibosheth to look at David and say no thanks? How senseless would it be this morning for you to reject God's loving kindness? Accept his kindness this morning. Repent of your sins. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you wonder from him, come back this very morning. Let's at the very least, let's talk about it. If you're not right with God, make it right while we stand and while we sing.